when customer driving about for the, this car, I do want to see about for their smile, meaning some feeling of the happiness, which means for a synchronized car. And especially this synchronized is not only one way. Sometimes people say the car is your extension. You are the commander, so the car must move by your command. Sometimes yes, but sometimes this two-way interactive conversation very important for the, our sports car. That is the Z. If you would have asked me in 2017 if I thought Nissan would ever build another Z car after the 370, I would have told you there is no way it's happening. But it's a testament to how things change. I never thought that I'd be sitting in this position telling a story about a new Z car for the fans of it, for the people that want to learn, and for telling the story of those that were involved in making it all happen. Now in this video, you're going to get a little bit of the story, the history. You're gonna learn about all the technical details and then of course how it drives, something that hopefully you'll walk away feeling that you got something out of it. I'm a super Z enthusiast. I had a three Z in the past and each other car gave me about for some inspiration or some direction of the future of the Z, especially that's the styling or a beauty design or a motif. These are the important of the Z car. I have a very vague sense of my, the first time I, I saw a Z uh, in Miami. I was, pro, I was less than 10 for sure. And I certainly didn't know I wanted to be a car designer yet. And I just fell in love with that car and uh, it kind of defined actually my, my love of cars of the 60s to be honest. No question, it has stayed with me, and uh, and then the opportunity to 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 act again on on it is a privilege. It started 2017, one of the handwritten note by me, and I wrote about for this paper to some executive. Let's go to the for New Z, and of course, not so easy. Five years struggling was so, so tough, but so interesting for our life. I'll never forget when we started talking about the project, things were very, very, very different. We were on extremely shaky ground. Uh, we were losing money and we had other issues going on that were very, very distracting. And uh, to talk about, oh, we, let's make a Z in this casual manner. You know, you can imagine that wasn't something that was uh, on the, you would speak out loud in the elevator. Um, but strangely, because of the circumstances of the company, and then these discuss discussions we were having about, we need to find the soul of Nissan again. I think this is what made it very different, and that the Z is in very in many many people's minds the soul. I mean, for Nissan, it's the GTR and the Z, but uh, they're not above or below each other. They're both different parts, and uh, I think the the fact that we were searching for our soul uh, and we were making Aria, uh, that the Z was just kind of naturally bubbled through. Um, all the, the, the cracks in the rock all the way up and, and actually didn't have a lot of problems. 
um, that, that we normally have in a normal business of justifying a business case, uh, seeking for profits or we don't do. Uh, the Z didn't have those. It had other issues because our ambition to make a Z, like exactly what do we want to make, uh, that that was something that we discussed much more, not if, but what. So on top of let's make a two-door sports car that no one clearly wants in the marketplace, um, let's make it even tougher <laughs> and let's made it to an engine which is spectacular but has a lot of torque and has a lot of its own spirit and part of that spirit is didn't have a roommate call a manual transmission. So dealing with all of, you know adding more to the plate of engineering was a very interesting phase and even within product planning do people really want manuals? Yes, of course. Then the Supra came and we, we noticed, oh my God, look how much chatter and I'm not going to say rejection, but complaint of where's my manual started to bubble up and actually we had already made the decision. So there was a sense of, oh, okay, that relatively tough request, additional request, was real. I mean, it was based on intuition because we didn't have the evidence, but the intuition became very loud and, uh, and well, the voices became very loud and informed our intuition and thank God because pretty much that's all people talk about. So without question, the evolution of the Z, it's a 240 because it was a fundamental invention. And, and then the 260 and these are, and the 280 are a kind of evolutions of this, this theme. The 300 took it someplace else. And this is, uh, I have huge respect for this. Uh, Jun Shimizu was the head of global design and uh, this quiet guy that we actually very almost never saw in California in the studio. Uh, and so, but a very powerful thinker, inventor. Uh, the, the idea to get rid of all the references that we had become accustomed to on the Z and make a revolution. And this revolution is not just shape in the sense of silhouette, well, it's no longer long hood and rear cabin. Uh, he changed that, of course. But also this minimalism, this Japanese futurism actually is his. We speak of it now out of respect, in a sense, for him. <laughs> but uh, they were studying uh, minimalism at the time, and they, they brought in some artists that talked about uh, from an artistic side of how powerful less can be. There was nothing on that car that didn't need to be on that car. And uh, this still has, sits with me today. When you think of the, the 350, this came at an interesting time that we should reflect on today with the Z because it was a time of revolution. Uh, it was a time of uh, an alliance that came after, uh, you know, we, we kind of went downhill steeply before the alliance came and new energy, new ideas, new spirit. I was involved in that car. Uh, I was one of the design managers and one of the designers. Uh, my interior was actually part of the Z Proto. It was the design thing. And uh, it was at a time where we weren't thinking about the 240, actually. It's, uh, the cast of characters is almost the same in design. We we're all still there. <laughs> um, but at that time, it was finding the new Nissan. So I, I think, the, of course, the 370 after that uh, it starts to tickle a little bit of the, the long hood and the cabin, but still it was a forward-looking, purely forward-looking car. The Z, from the beginning, when we were doing it, and when I say the Z, the new one, <laughs> um, this was more complex because we wanted 
to make a, a very modern car. But we were in a point in our lives in Nissan that we really wanted to touch the soul, the beginning, which was the 240. So I do think time, where you're sitting today, has an effect on what you're seeing forward and backwards. So that's why the, the more nostalgic Z happened now, not 20 years ago. Where the debates were around uh, were about the interior which is interesting enough in the sense that uh, you would think that this has a more clear path from an intuitive point of view. But no, it wasn't a how much, you know, do we do a digital meter or not? Should that be analog? Should that be homage? Or should that be forward facing? We had a lot of discussion. And also, okay, one thing is deciding, another thing is doing. <laughs> and uh, because these kind of screens have a tendency to make uh, a cockpit or an interior environment quite digital and that's not what we wanted. We didn't want a pure futuristic feeling to, to the interior. We wanted the same kind of respect for the line of Z's that is happening outside to actually happen inside. Obviously it would be more digital and that's the way we went. Um, but uh, we we worked on that and which parts were homage, of course, the three dials, um, but also this sense of horizontality of the interior where we didn't want this, this big mass that had happened on, on a lot of, on the 350 and, and 370. So this lightweight and purposeful aspect that existed on 240, uh, we wanted that. Um, but this sense of minimalism also that's in the 300, uh, so I want people to feel that at first, that this, oh my God, that's so beautiful. I know there's a very obvious thing. It's not a very designer -y message, but we wanted that. We want everyone, everywhere to say that's the most beautiful car in the world. And, uh, and I, I do think rear three quarter and some views like that in the side view, um, we, we come very close to, to making a, a true beauty. Hi, my name is Amal Salako, and I'm an engineer out of Nissan, uh, working at the Proving Grounds in Arizona. I've been working at Nissan over the past eight and a half years, and me and my team have been working on the all-new Nissan Z for the past two years, fine-tuning the dynamic performance. With the all-new Z, we really wanted to focus on improving handling, ride comfort, as well as NVH. And so kind of one of the core characteristics we needed to improve was the overall body rigidity. So we did increase the body stiffness by about 20%, the overall torsional rigidity by about 11%, as well as the wheel stiffness by about 45%. So a lot of those changes have been done in the engine bay area, as well as the back of the vehicle, both under floor, um, around the hatch, and then within the hatch design itself. Um, as for NVH, we did add a lot of um, isolation material on the floor as well as the, um, in the dash. And then uh, we have foam in the tires as well. Really, that's not to change the overall characteristic of a sport performance car, but really just make it a little bit more palatable for the everyday driving. The sheet metal on this vehicle really is all new. Uh, we do have an all-new aluminum HUD, so that is unique from the 370Z. Another unique feature that we have that is actually shared with the GTR is we use the same glue adhesive for the front windshield and the rear window as well. Uh, we also improve the aerodynamics to really uh, increase the downforce in the front um, uh, under the lip as well as in the rear spoiler. And then also streamline the, uh, the airflow on the side of the vehicle and then the convergence point from the roof of the vehicle as well. So with the all-new Z, we have 20% increased acceleration. We have 13% increase in max cornering capacity, as well as 15% reduction in understeer. So with all of this increased capacity, we really wanted to take a lot of time to develop the trust that our driver has in our vehicle so you can drive it to max limits and feel comfortable and, of course, have a lot of fun. The body or underbody of the Z car, Jack, is an evolution of many years past. Yes, it is. And this is the new 2023 Nissan Z. And we're the first journalists here in North America to get to drive this car. And in this segment of our video, 
we're going to do our best to answer the questions that Z enthusiasts or people who are just really excited about this car may have. The big story is this is still on the same platform of the prior generation 370Z. This is still built on the Z34 platform, but 80% of the parts are all new. That means taillights, headlights, fenders, hang-on panels, but the underneath looks very familiar, Jack. Yes, you still have an aluminum front subframe, aluminum double wishbone suspension in the front, which means the upper and lower control arms are aluminum. The rear subframe is still steel, but the upper and lowers in the rear are also aluminum. However, the suspension tuning, the steering system, and a lot of the finer details that go into this car are very different. So with the suspension tuning, yes, this is a double wishbone car, which makes it fairly unique in its segment. The only other car under $60,000 that I can think of that is a performance car that is double wishbone is the Mazda Miata. So Mark, walk the viewers through what the advantages are of that. When you have a double wishbone suspension, typically what you have is more dynamic negative camber that is increased under compression. A strut suspension, like in the Toyota Supra and many other cars, they have to do two things at once. They have to be load bearing, which means they have to hold the car up and the upright. So that strut is holding the car up and it has to accommodate lateral load. So when you're loading that car up, it's like basically standing on your side and hanging over and then somebody kicking your knee, trying to kick you over. That's, that's what's happening in a strut where the double wishbone suspension doesn't have that because the shock absorber is not holding up the car. So when it comes to the suspension components though, you have an all new mono tube damper. The prior generation car had a twin tube. Walk me through the advantages of that. It, it just holds up to heat better. It, it han handles the thermal cycling from high performance driving. And there are other advantage of a monotube tube damper that I'm not gonna go into in the scope of this video, but the spring rates, the damper rates have been increased in the front and the rear to accommodate the additional weight. So those are the primary changes in suspension along with stiffer bushings. Now they have not been able to tell us, the engineers haven't been able to tell us the specific rates, the amount that they've increased the bushings, but these are all subtle changes because of the change in the engine and just some of the dynamic properties. I will say the front and rear sway bars are also stiffer than the car that came before this. The front subframe bushings are the same or mostly the same, however, the rear subframe has been greatly stiffened to do with the fact that this car produces a lot more torque. The other thing I do want to talk about, Mark, is the EPS rack. So gone is the hydraulic steering from the 370Z, and in, and in its place is an EPS rack. And they do that for two reasons. One, they argue that you can create a more direct steering feel. And I would say, after driving this car, they've accomplished that. The other reason they've gone to EPS is it allows them to tune for their Pro Pilot Assist program, which has a lot of the autonomous driving aids that you may or may not want on a sports car like this. And that's something you couldn't do with hydraulic steering before. You basically had, it was just a mechanical system. They are able to control the electronic portion of the rack by having the motor on the right side of the rack, the input shaft on the left half of the car, and then if you need to send assistance to kind of keep you in your lane, it can control the motor for that and, and all the things that go along with it, including controlling drive modes, the amount of voltage that is sent to the motor for assistance. Hydraulic systems couldn't do that, and it's more difficult to package a hydraulic unit with all the associated lines in the pump. They've also changed the front wheels on this car to give you a little bit more mechanical grip. They've grown in width, so you've gone from a 245 section front tire to a 255. They've also changed the front caster the other thing to talk about is the brakes. The master cylinder has been recalibrated to give you a more linear pedal feel, but the brake calipers and the rotors are carryovers from the prior generation car. On the sport trim, you get a two piston, one piston setup. And on the performance trim, which we are under, you get the brakes off the former Nismo, which is an Acubono, four piston front, two piston rear. The one thing I will bring up though, as a con to this, is because this car is now faster than it used to be and heavier than it used to be, you will probably need to upgrade pads and fluids for sure if you're going to drive this car really hard on like the track. Any, like any car that you're going to take to the track, it's, it's the typical thing. The brakes are not going to hold up. The brake pad compound has been changed from the previous generation, and that is likely due to the regulations to ban copper in the lining. So all manufacturers are changing the pad. We don't really have like details more than that. But the big change, along with what you said, increased caster angle. We don't have alignment numbers, but it's somewhere between six and seven is optimal for a car like this that's double wishbone. That combination with something major happened in the rear jack. They've changed the rear differential in this car. They've gone to a clutch-based limited slip versus the viscous style in the prior generation car. And there are a couple reasons for it. A, 
the ore first, the prior viscous differential had a lot of problems. It would go open diff for no reason, it would overheat, and then lead to the most connected fueling we're in. Now they've gone to a clutch-based limited slip differential. Mark, I think the next thing to talk about very quickly is the aerodynamics underneath this car. This still looks like a prior generation product, so compared to something like a Supra, you don't have all the aero panels spanning the whole length of the vehicle, but they have done their best to increase downforce due to the fact that they've added extra cooling to this car. One of the really great improvements we wanted to focus on was a cooling component from the, the 370Z. So the front grille opening has pretty much almost doubled in size and we really wanted to maximize airflow into all of those cooling components. But we also have uh, intercoolers for our turbos plus a radiator specific for those intercoolers. We have a transmission cooler that is only for the automatic transmission as well as an engine oil cooler. Now as Melissa started to talk about all the cooling solutions, there have been some changes to the front end for aerodynamics. You create this chasm to cool everything, so they've had to make different changes to the under tray to balance out aerodynamics front and rear. And let's be completely fair to this car. You know, talking about a forty, fifty thousand dollar price range, just like the Supra. These are not race cars. They're not trying to be race cars. They're trying to find that balance between what a driver of a generation car like this wants. They want a connected feel. They want rear wheel drive. They want good horsepower. So you may look at certain parts of the underbody, like the exhaust is pretty much laughable. And why would Nissan as a company spend thousands, millions of dollars in development for an exhaust system when they know it's going to be completely stripped off this car. And these are the little bits and pieces you can tell here that Nissan, they knew where to put their money in this refresh or update of this car and where not to put it. And they have listened to the consumer base of the previous generation owners. Simple things like on the manual transmission, you see a slave cylinder that is now external. You can remove it with two bolts, unscrew your hydraulic line, and now you can replace it without having to drop the trans or drop the, the subframe. And that's really great for somebody that is gonna drive the hell out of this. Yeah, and that's exactly what you should be doing in a 400 horsepower mm -hmm. rear wheel drive manual or automatic sports car. In terms of our automatic transmission, we now offer a nine speed versus a seven speed. So this provides better acceleration overall, so better response as well as better fuel economy. So we improve our uh, coverage ratio by about 40%. Our first gear is lower and then our upper gears are uh, better for fuel economy as well versus a seven speed. We now offer active shift control, which manages the shifting characteristics based off of your driving style. And we now have launch control offered as well. Now in terms of the manual transmission, we still offer a six speed. It is carryover from the 370Z, but we did make some improvements. So that would be the first and second gear um, synchros were improved for a more direct, better feel. And we also offer launch control as well. A cool characteristic of our launch control for our manual uh, transmission is it is power on shifting. So while you are going through uh, or using that system, you can shift while you have full uh, wide open throttle. So basically the engine manages a torque reduction by using our electric variable valve timing to reduce the torque on that end, and then you're able to maximize your acceleration. So a really big story about the all new Z is of course the new engine. It is shared with the uh, Q50Q60 Red Sport, the 400 horsepower version. So it has that uh, three liter twin turbo, 400 horsepower, 350 foot pounds of torque. It has a reinforced open deck design. It has uh, turbo speed sensors. It has an integrated exhaust manifold. Um, as well as electric variable valve timing. A key difference between the all new Z and the Q50, Q60 Red Sport is the addition of a recirculation valve. So this provides better direct feel when you are lifting off the throttle. So previously we'd have to delay the deceleration a little bit to allow all the extra airflow to go through the system. With this recirculation valve, it basically acts like a blow off valve, but instead of releasing the extra air into the atmosphere, it recirculates it back to the air intake side. So Mark, as Melissa said, this is a VR30. It's a twin turbo V6 with an open deck. It's direct injected. It makes slightly less than 20 PSI of peak boost, and it makes 400 horsepower and 350 foot-pounds of torque. So versus the V6, it's replacing. It has less displacement. It makes more peak horsepower, and much like a naturally aspirated car, pulls hard to redline, but it produces torque much earlier and down low. You get two different exhaust setups. And if you think about this car, Nissan has done a really good job addressing the issues that people had with the prior, prior generation car. Even if you look at the structure of the engine bay itself, 
day one, they're giving you a strut tower bar. With a, an adjustable preload on it, which is not common at all in any production car. So again, it goes back to the, the concept, they know who's gonna be buying this, and they know that this car as a whole is a send off to the sports cars of old. So if you're somebody that's gonna modify this, companies like AMS, when they get their hands on it, it's, it's going to be a car you're gonna see 10, 15, 20 years down the road, much like you saw the 350 and pretty much all of the cars of these generations getting hacked up, messed up, even turned into something they weren't originally, but they're gonna be on the roads just completely pushing the boundaries. You're gonna be flying in yes. this car Th once this you has, modify it. This car has such a higher overhead than the previous generation car because of this, yes. the transmission changes. It's set up for those future customers that are gonna take this into the next couple generations. And they didn't just throw an atomic bomb in the engine bay. They addressed things like cooling, as we talked about earlier. The manual car gets a dedicated heat exchanger for the oil, a bigger radiator, and a more powerful fan. If you get the automatic car, you get a trans cooler and an oil cooler. And they've done things to the gearbox. So the manual transmission, which is still six speed, it does still have rev match, and it has a new shift linkage, which does feel better to drive than the prior generation car. You can still rush the gearbox, you can still be hard with it, but it feels a little bit more organic and more positive in its shift. It has a more mechanical feel to it, a more direct feel, and it's one of those things you only know this when you drive the 370 and this car back to back. And a lot of these things may seem incremental, and we talk about this, endlessly with cars as the next generation car comes up. They're not really reinventing the wheel, but in the all of the parts add up to a massive feel that this is going to be an amazing car. And I really hope that all of the stuff we've been hammering home translates into a great driving experience, Jack. All right, Mark, let's head to PTC and talk about how the driving experience has been transformed or not by the engineering that went into this thing. where are we? PTC. That stands for Polecat Training Center. And I'm gonna do my best to make chicken salad out of chicken shit. It is wet at this track. Of course, given our luck, but the big story is how does this drive compared to the other car? And what did all their engineering actually translate to? So less talk and more action. All right. Considering we just got out of the 370Z, Jack, uh, back to back with that car on the same track at the same time. This Tell thing me hauls it. ass. <laughs> oh my God. That's an understatement how much faster this car is. They say, you know, in a straight line, maybe like 20%, but it's the overall package that is so much better. So let's talk through that. Let's talk about where the improvements are. So this VR30 makes torque way earlier. That's the benefit of having a twin turbo V6. So when you get out of a corner, you're working with more torque so you can stay a gear higher if you need to. Yes, where you'd have to go into the tight stuff, and this is a great track for this, because in the tight stuff you were always downshifting in a second. Here, you're in third and fourth, and the, the benefit of that is the car is a little bit less jerky, it's a little less harder, it's a little bit easier to deal with keeping smooth on the throttle. Now, if you go down in a second by mistake, you better be prepared to go sideways. <laughs> but it is, a much more connected driving experience. And the engineer, she talked about this. It's a car that feels easier at the limit. The last car, and I'm not, I was not the biggest fan of the 370Z, I'll be entirely honest, because it felt like all the inputs were a layer removed from you. And yes, you could fix it in the aftermarket, but stock, there's a sense of vagueness, even though it had hydraulic steering and 
you know, a lot of good bits, and it was obviously still double wishbone. You didn't feel that connected to what you were doing. No, I, I told uh, Dan Pass from Nissan, I'm like, the biggest, the, the way I can describe it is the 370 felt bulky compared to this car. And that, I mean, it's strange because... This car's heavier. It, this car really is heavier. And where the what they've done here to make it feel less bulky is the steering rack, the way they've tuned the steering rack, the new rear... Differential, LSD, the yeah. differential is a huge part of how this car rotates in and the way they've managed the balance of <laughs> <laughs> keeping this thing neutral. Like what you just did there, the slides and the way that it slides is way more progressive and easy to control. It's way less twitchy and it's just easier to turn in. That's the biggest thing. The car feels connected front and rear. And because you have that, that sense of confidence when you're pushing this car, you can rely on the architecture. It is wet out, and yes, we're not at the absolute limit of adhesion, but even though there is this lack of front grip, I still feel confident to trail brake the car in, get the front end to load up, and work with the rear end. The viscous limit is slip in the last car. It either randomly would go open, or it would try to straighten out the yeah, car. I couldn't yeah. rely it was on it. It was way more vague of a driving experience, which is why it felt a lot more cumbersome to get around the tight stuff. This course is a perfect example of how easy this car is to rotate through, to control, and to get the most out of it. So it's like the last car was, the joke was it was an American muscle car. It kind yes. of felt like a Camaro. This car is a better blend between like the old S2000, what the new Miata is, and a bigger, higher horsepower like GT car. I think the other thing you're going to notice when you drive this thing out on the street, and to be fair, we've spent almost no time with it outside of yeah. here. In the bubble on a track, of course. It is. It seems like a quieter, more refined car, and it doesn't suck you out of the performance car part. It feels just like a better, better engineered, more it's advanced It's a car you can live with car. every yes. day, and the, the other part of this experience is, you know, twin turbos don't sound like anything. The fake engine noise that they've applied here is way less nauseating <laughs> than the uh, naturally aspirated car it replaces. The other car was so gross, especially when you drive these back to back. That was just like a synthesizer. This doesn't have that. It's, no, it's, it's about 50% reduced. It doesn't make you want to throw up in your mouth. The only thing that's making me want to throw up, dude, is this <laughs> drive. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, my question then, Mark, is this is the, the, the question that everybody's going to be talking about. How does this compare to the other Japanese dedicated sports car, the Supra? The, well, that's not a, a Japanese well, car. excuse but me, German the, Japanese. The German Japanese car. So the big di difference here for me is the front end. <laughs> the front end is way better on this car. And as a byproduct, the way that the back and the front talk to each other, it, it transforms this car. So if you had it, if you wanted a driver's car, manual transmission, the rear differential works better. The front end is more direct. It loads up better. This feels much more connected in terms of driving fast out of the box, where the Supra is more of a wild beast. It is constantly trying to oversteer under throttle. Uh, it doesn't turn in and then rotate naturally. It always wants to rotate through, like spin is yes. what I'm talking about. So stock versus stock, this is far more enjoyable as a driver's car. Is it faster though? That I can't tell you, but it really doesn't matter at this point. I think this is a better driving car for the money. I, I agree. The value part of this car being several thousand dollars less money than the Supra is huge. And the fact that this car will start around $40,000, yeah. and once the aftermarket gets a hold of this thing, most oh like they did God. with the Supra, you're going to be fucking Yeah, th this is a good age to live in as they close out these high-performance, like, rear-wheel drive, internal combustion cars. These, those two cars are a perfect example of you can get, you can kill yourself in these things. Yes. Once you start screwing with it, they're going to be so ridiculously fast, and as this stands, uh, this is uh, at least a hundred percent improvement over the 370 in terms of a driver's car feeling because they fixed all the things that the aftermarket basically fixed with it in the past. So what are your cons then? Because there has to be something wrong with this car. Well, what do you I, not like? I mean, I, I think, you know, the interior is completely a carryover. They've tarted it up a bit. Um, I, I mean, it, it's mostly nitpicky stuff like that. And I'll be completely honest. I haven't spent enough time on the in this car at all on the street to figure out what annoys the hell out of me. But uh, as, a, as a performance car, I love it. I, I 
I can't really complain at the price point. No, man. I like. I thought I would hate this. The elect- brakes. Uh, yes, the, the, the brakes are the, weak. The brakes out of the box here. You know, you know, there's going to be ten different versions of this car with different brake packages. So, you know, you're going to have to do pads and probably swap in a big brake kit if you're tracking this thing all the time. But other than that, I can't find anything right now. I thought I'd hate the steering being electric, and you know, everyone's bemoaning that. But it's better than the last. It's car. way better than the last car. Yeah. So, Mark, with my last power slide, I think it's time for us to. To close out. Close this out because I'm, 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 uh, I'm about ready to puke, seriously. If you've been around long enough, you've seen the sports car and enthusiast market evolve quite a bit. Cars are faster and more capable than they have ever been. But as a byproduct, we've lost a lot of the connectivity, that mechanical connection between man and machine. And with the push towards EVs and marketing and people's obsession with going zero to 60 in one second, you lose some of that balanced part of driving that the Z attempts to repair. They're taking an old school concept and injecting some modernism in it while still trying to keep all the things that the fans of this car have loved. And a lot of that is because you have the old guard working on it. You know you have people that have seen this shift, this change in trajectory in the modern world of sports cars, and they wanted to keep some of the past elements in it. And that's why the Z is good. They've taken each part of the car and made it better without stripping a lot of the driver engagement in it. And the sad part is a lot of these higher end sports cars, the cars that actually make you feel something have become automatonium for the, the common man. You have to pay so much money for that experience anymore that you're basically, you put it out of your head. And I'm not saying that 40 to $50,000 for a Z is cheap but it's way cheaper than spending over $100,000 plus for some of these higher end products. So what the Z does great is they have improved the manual transmission overall. It's a much more connected experience. The steering feels way more direct and it communicates the front and the rear end much better. Now as a car, as its base starting point, of course, you know, maybe the suspension might be a bit soft. The brakes are not all that capable, and you know as the course of a life cycle of a car goes, they're going to add these bits and pieces to to keep the the car fresh. But one thing that you're going to know 100%, and this is the way that you can judge any great car, is its longevity. Not only reliability, of course, is part of it, but I'm talking about relevancy in terms of ownership. What are owners doing not just five years from now, but what is that enthusiast community like 10, 15, 20 years? And what made the 300, the 350, the 370 great is you still still see people tearing them apart, crashing them, racing them, doing stupid things to them, but they're passionate about it. And that's what keeps the soul, that's what keeps these cars alive. And the new Z, from exterior, some of the interior design, and then drivability, it's going to be that car that people are gonna look back on in 20 years and be like, that was cool what they were doing then. And that's my overall feeling of the new Z. Thank you.